Thanks for joining me today, Cameron Robbins up in Castlemaine, Victoria. Hi, Danny. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, looking forward to having a bit of a chat um, about some of your past projects and upcoming projects. Um, a nice spot to start um, might be this beautiful work behind me, which is um, a lovely work which was actually created um, out the front of the building here back in August of 2018. Um, when you undertook a public program as part of the National Works on Paper, uh, would you like to just uh, sort of briefly introduce this work and, and talk us through how you made that um, on that day? Yeah, sure, Danny. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm not sure if I remember the title of this work. I think it was probably something with dates and times and places written on it and a wind yeah. direction. Yep. Um, and I did. I remember we did this. I did this um, using a uh, wind drawing, wind power drawing instrument that I've created that has like two main axes, which is a wind direction, um, which kind of governs the movement of the paper on the drawing board and wind speed, which governs the speed of the pen. And um, so the wind direction and speed sort of influence the way the drawing goes. And then it has a mechanical kind of rotary motion and it also allows rain to come onto the paper and, you know, all the crazy marks that happened with the increasing wind. And I remember that day it did get windier and windier, which was perfect. And also you had that amazing concrete pad there that looked like it was put in, especially for the wind drawing machine. It fitted so that was great. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It was like a perfect size um, slab. And yeah, that we had like a, it was like a live drawing project um, for interested people to come and have a look. At. So, so we had about 30 people at the public program that was, um, the de drawing demonstration of the wind uh, instrument and also artist talks back in the space, you know, in front of a work that I had in the National Works on Paper exhibition. And so everyone got to see, you know, the wind drawing actually happening, which is great to watch because it's quite spooky watching, you know, sort of what was an inanimate object start creating lines and all these marks and they're quite, you know, lovely, compelling marks after a while and it does start to look purposeful and like there is a you know, ghost in the machine feeling. Um, and people really loved seeing that. Yeah. And you know, it, was a, it was a lovely day. And it was, uh, I, I still remember that day because it was absolutely freezing and uh, <laughs> I just returned home for, uh, from being over in Japan where it was quite warm, summer over there. And this was my first adventure outside <laughs> into the freezing morning to wind. Um, but it was, it was a great day because I guess your work, which was in National Works on Paper, um, obviously similar to this work, was a, a drawing. So it was the outcome of um, a process which had happened. So for people to actually see um, the process of making that work, uh, it was quite fascinating. Yeah, that, well, it's good, yeah, because you know, look, it's interesting showing the wind drawings and I really like showing them without the drawing instrument and the machine and all that. You know, it's great when they stand on their own and people get a sense that, you know, it was something not the hand, it was something else. It's another agency at work um, and they make up their own minds. But then having the, the machine outside then, um, you know, sort of brought to light, you know, the actual process of, of making the work and yeah it's just interesting for me because it's kind of challenging because you know not all of the wind drawings are what i call my favorites you know so um so some of them you know don't don't seem to say so much and other ones really seem to say something and so you know it's all, it can be a bit confronting having everybody gathered around going oh you just let the machine do it <laughs> <laughs> there's all that side of it and they're, they're interesting discussions about you know, where does the artist start and stop and well, I consider the wind drawing instrument as a like basically an extension to a paintbrush or a pen where you know you see Arthur Boyd in his studio with a huge um, paintbrush tied to a stick you know painting the right the top of some huge painting and I've always looked at that going yeah well it's sort of like that but it's a stick and a wire and a pulley and you know it's, it's a more more steps removed but, you know, um, it's still kind of, you know, I guess, my brain drive, driving the whole thing. And it's interesting, if I get other people to operate the drawing machine, you know, the drawings are you know, not really like the ones that 
that I come up with. So that's that's an interesting thing. It's my little project I love working with. And that portable drawing instrument is one I take around and I've been working on it for years, um, replacing parts and modifying. So it's very much like, um, what's that Zen paradox of the river? Like it's the same river, but different water all the time. And it's, what's the other one? Oh, the ax, you know, it's like my grandfather's ax, but it's had three new heads and two new handles. <laughs> and the machine's a bit like that. Just keep adding new bits and replacing and yeah, always upgrading. So it's a very exciting project. And the thing is, it's a drawing project and the drawings are always different and interesting. And that's what, you know, compels me to keep going. Mm. You, um, we also showed your work, Solar Loggerheads, which we loaned from the Gippsland Art Gallery um, last year, I think that was, early last year. And um, you spent some time down at the uh, Police Point Artist in Residency. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the experience of being down on that place and the work that you made down there and um, also the programs that you were involved in? Oh, yeah, that's, well, Police Point's been a great, um, you know, revelation and discovery for me. Um, and I, I managed, I've, I've got to stay there, I think, two or maybe three times by now. Mm. Um, and it's a very inspiring place and perfect for, for my sort of work because, um, you know, you can have the wind drawing machine set up outside and several experiments going and you're just right in the great weather there that comes over the, uh, over the dunes. Um, I've had a few different projects set up there, but I always take the wind drawing instrument because that's a great place to operate that. And last time I was there, I actually um, wanted to make a drawing that was an homage to the black hole image that was um, created by um, or a, a scientist, a young female scientist, Katie Bowman. And she, orchestrated this amazing um, astronomical project which was coordinating 100 telescopes or more across the planet Earth and they were all focused on this one galaxy and she managed to image the black hole at the centre of the galaxy and it was the first black hole image ever made and it was this great you know, black background with this red and orange disc or donut sort of shape with various patches of different colour representing, you know, comings and goings of material. And um, I thought I, I could get some black watercolour paper and start working with some, uh, you know, pigment inks and um, metallic inks and create a sort of a black hole because the black the drawing machine is an orbital device that's going to create orbits of the pen. So it becomes very astronomical and galactic. So that was a great thing for me to be able to link in kind of an astronomical um, part or an astronomical aspect to the drawings. And I'm going to be, I think I'm showing one of those soon down there, hopefully, if I get into NWAP again. That's true, yeah. Um, I've, ent I've entered one in there. Submission in the National Works on Paper, yeah. Yeah, I've put another submission in and I haven't got in a few times. I've got into it once, you know, so it's not easy to get into. So <laughs> I've always want to put my best foot forward. <laughs> and we'll see how we go. But um, those works have been really popular and people's funny. I was putting an application into National Works on paper and then someone bought the drawing I was going to put in and then I had to do another one and someone bought that one. So that's exciting. <laughs> um, you were, when you were down at Police Point, you also were um, flying kites down there as well at one stage. Oh, that's right. Yeah, well, I've got this lovely project I keep going back to whenever I get the chance because you know, it's not always easy to find a spot to fly a box kite on a 200-metre uh, string, which is pretty high. Um, and I've got this photographic project I like to do, which is basically fly the kite at night. And so it's actually flying in front of all the stars if it's a you know, starry night. And if I've hung a, I can hang a light off the kite, like a you know, LED with a battery, torch sort of thing, um, sort of a sculptural light that I've made. And as the kite moves around in the wind eddies, you know, you're taking a long exposure photograph of that and it moves amongst the stars. And I position the camera in such a way that the, um, the kite was right in front of the constellation of Orion. So you have those three stars in the saucepan sort of doing this big scrape across the photo during the time exposure. And meanwhile, there's a lovely kind of drawing happening with the, the kite flying around. And it's lovely kind of 
you know, it's a bit like the way, you know, insects eat into the bark of a tree and you see those natural patterns mm. or snail patterns on the ground, you know, wind in the sand dunes, there's all those sort of feelings in there, but it's sort of astronomical and aeronautical and it's a lot of fun. I love mm. that one. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I really, um, I think your practice is, is fascinating in terms of the translation of that mark making across um, say flying kites or the, um, the drawing um, machines. Um, one of the projects that you've been working on recently, recently is uh, working with wine. Um, talk a little bit about that project, the ferment CO2 drawings. How did that come about? Sounds uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's been a really interesting project actually. It's, um, yeah, well, it's, just, as it's interesting working with wine because it's not like I'm a real wine buff or wine enthusiast. Like, I've never really known much about wine, but um, I had a fellow who was always coming to my exhibitions, especially at Stockroom down in Kyneton, and saying, oh, you know, if you, if you like wind and weather and stars, you've got to come and see wine fermenting because it's very interesting the way the bubbles um, come up and it's basically carbon dioxide being released by the yeast, which is eating sugar. Um, and anyway, the, the pattern of it, the way it comes up, it sort of waxes and wanes, then gets busy and then quiet and then responds to temperature and all this stuff. And so eventually I did go and see um, his laboratory where he makes the wine. Um, and it was just after having moved to Castle Maine from Melbourne and because there's not so much wind up here, like strangely, it's not, not as windy as Melbourne or other coastal places. So um, I was looking for some available energy to work from, you know, because I'm always sort of looking for where, where to go. Uh, and then I started gravitating over there to the laboratory and uh, I made a little instrument that, you know, was able to translate the CO2 bubbles coming out of the wine vat um onto and then it, yeah, that would drive a pen that on there was drawing on a rotating page that was you know very slowly rotating about 48 hours per revolution and so you can get a time-based drawing of like the life and death of different populations of yeast that are coming into the wine and yeah it's really fascinating like every drawing is completely different and it's been a revelation and um again you know started out as a drawing project so that yeah, they're always interesting, so it keeps me going. But then it's got all these other, you know, biological factors and there's a big environmental picture there too because we're dealing with carbon dioxide that is released in, you know, an agricultural system. And, you know, that's a big factor that's, you know, contributing to climate change. And um, very interesting looking at the carbon cycle, you know, regarding wine, uh, especially like a natural process like Maison Lapalou, who is the winemaker, uses. <clears throat> um, basically, they compost all of the great parts that they don't use in the wine. And so, therefore, the carbon is captured and only a little bit is released during the process of the winemaking. Um, and the, you know, the plants take in the carbon dioxide out of the air anyway when they're growing. So it's very interesting to look at that and just start to kind of unpick the, the crazy kind of intricate web of carbon capture and <clears throat> carbon dioxide production on planet Earth. So, yeah, there's a big picture and a small picture and it's got a lot of, lot of legs, that project. Everyone loves seeing it. <clears throat> For me, it's really good because it's self-contained. So you can show it in a museum and you don't have to have a connection to the outside, which, you know, with my wind projects, you've got to like basically yeah, knock a hole in the wall. Yeah. So the wine project is really good for my practice, especially showing in a museum or an institution because um, it's a self-contained system. So you can have the wine in the museum and uh, the machines there and it's all drawing. You don't have to have a connection to the outside like at, Mona, I was always cutting holes through the fabric of the building to the outside with diamond saws and or getting them to do it. And you know, not all museums are willing to do that. Mm. Did you have to um, translate your sort of devices much to to create an instrument to actually translate that um, that drawing? <clears throat> yeah, well, the yeah the wine drawing. Um, I've actually called it enograph, which is O E N O graph. That's Greek for wine, is enos. And so, um, yeah, it's called the enograph. And um, 
I have to make a very delicate instrument for that because we're not talking about much carbon dioxide that comes out. It's just like a little pressure cooker sort of cap that you know, bubbles every now and then. You've probably seen those little um, sort of intestinal looking tubes that come out of a distillery. Oh, yeah. It's sort of like that, like a little little burp every now and then. Um, so yeah, very, it's a very delicate machine. It has a carbon fiber rod with aluminium wire, so it's all very lightweight and then finally balanced. And so there's, I, I had to change the pen too, to be like it's an engineering felt tip. So very light touch on the page um, because there's, there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of pressure there. Mm. Um, so it, whereas with the wind drawing, it's like, you know, you've got to, you can use like a bigger pen and heavier wires and stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting here yeah, working on this delicate instrument, you know, but it's still got to be robust enough to, kind of produce a drawing that might go for 12 days because I've got this um, drawing system that allows it to create a spiral that goes yeah, for like up to 250 hours, which is, you know, 10 days and a bit, 10 and a half days. So, yeah, it's really interesting time-based project. Um, I'm actually going to do another iteration of that I'm working on for um, uh, MCA in Sydney uh, in next march so that'll be interesting yeah yeah um i also wanted to ask you about uh, the project you did with uh was it the hepburn wind farm um working with the sort of the big towers the big wind towers over there <clears throat> yeah well that was that was another another thing that happened um from moving to castle main which is um you know i was basically driving down to geelong or somewhere via Dalesford and I kept noticing the two wind turbines that you can see on the hill at uh, Leonard's Hill and anyway I, I just had the idea of doing I thought that'd be a great place to do a wind um, project because obviously they're, they're built in the windiest spots and um, so I did a little bit of research and I found out who was um, the kind of manager of that uh, community wind farm and it happens to be a person called Taryn Lane who's a great art lover and um, facilitator of good things and she'd had David Booth David Booth from Ghost Patrol doing an art residency there and painting murals on the towers um, and so she was very receptive to my suggestion of doing a you know a sort of a self-funded residency where I, all I asked them for was access to the place um, and you know I'd take care of everything else and so that can be very empowering for an artist to do if you can find time to do it because, you know, the sort of balls in your court then and you can um, play it as, as you want. And, yeah, I, I was up there for about oh, three weeks, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, very exciting because, you know, you get some incredible winds there. They've really got these wind maps and they look at them and build the turbines right in these kind of natural geological funnels where the wind just comes through. So there's great weather and exciting um, stuff going on all the time and I actually saw a tornado form over Dalesford while I was up there and that was a benefit of being up there all day every day for weeks you know I saw all these great weather phenomenon and I was up there at night as well doing star works and watching the wind turbines and being around those massive machines was just beautiful you know it was like I felt like I was in the sea with the because they make sounds like water swishing and otherwise very quiet and it nice to be around sort of a benign industry, basically. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating opportunity to, to engage with um, those sort of built structures. Yeah, yeah, really was, yeah, it's great, great to be around and, you know, quite inspiring that, you know, you can build something that big that is still um, just responds to, you know, a natural force that's not sort of digging something up and burning it. It's um, a yeah, very nice, very nice feeling. And so I produced a series of wind drawings and a series of um, night photographs of lights moving in the wind with other uh, wind sort of devices. I didn't do my kite up there. I was a bit worried about getting tangled up in the wind turbine and ending up sort of, you know, up in the hubs sort of with my hand caught in it. <laughs> Shutting the whole system down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um. <laughs> It'd be great to hear about uh, some of your current projects. You mentioned you're working on a um, project for the MCA coming up. Mm. Um, what are some of the other projects you've got in the works? Yeah, well, uh, 
yeah, there's a few things happening actually. I've got um, well, I've got two projects with the MCA. I don't know if I'm supposed to be announcing everything yet, but I'm you know work doing a lot of work on them. So one's a kind of a group exhibition, but another one is a they have a commission on the rooftop terrace at MCA, the one overlook where the cafe is, and you overlook the harbour, and the, it's a great spot, an amazing spot. So I'm actually designing a a, a wind drawing machine that's going to be up there for uh, a 12 month period and it's actually going to draw from wind direction but it has two kind of direction sensors and it's going to be drawing onto a marble slab with graphite so it's sort of quite permanent looking and very heavily engineered because it's i think it's six floors up on the harbour so you've got to be prepared for gales and um maybe even stronger than that um a gale is about 60 to 70 kilometers per hour and then you get a heavy gale and you end up with a cyclone. So I hope I don't get that. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of engineering going into that at the moment with big masonry anchors and, you know, heavy duty um, components and you know, 30 mil shaft is going to be the main spindle for the drawing machine. So, yeah, it's like making a boat. It's going to be, you know, pretty solid. So that's a great opportunity to be working on. Um, and then I'm doing the wine drawing machine for the other part of the exhibition. So I'm kind of modifying all that and um, having, I'm outsourcing a few components and then I, I like to make a few things in my own studio. I've got a really good engineering setup so I can actually make, you know, working components. I still think, you know, as an art project, I sort of want my hand in, in some of the making, um, which is you know, the fun bit, let's face it. Um, it's, it's really great to be actually in the studio. And I must admit, with the, you know, lockdown periods and everything, it's been, you know, in pretty intense studio periods. So I've really got the studio working well and I can make stuff in there that works and uh, looks good. And so, yeah, that's been pretty inspiring. Yeah, and you've got a great studio set up there um, out the front of your place, which is pretty, uh, I guess, for a lot of people can imagine, it's pretty... Um, heavy duty to be able to construct some of those um, machines that you, you work with and create? Yeah, well, I found that, you know, you, you've got to get serious about this if you want them to work because, you know, like with, with, with kinetic art in particular, like, you know, it's got to sort of be working to working. I think Carl Andre said, well, when my, when my things aren't working, then it is working. <laughs> but, you know, with the bricks and that sort of tiles and stuff. But then... then um, then with kinetic art, it's got to actually be moving. And so, you know, not that everything is, has to be working all the time, but um, I've found that you really want to have reliable stuff. So, you know, some of the machines I make are a bit temperamental, obviously. Um, and a lot of them are designed for me to actually operate them. So that's why they're called instruments. It's more like a piano or a clarinet or something where you're actually, you know, manipulating it to, to do something. Um, other ones are a bit more automatic, like the wine making one is a bit more automatic. Um, basically, it's all slower and it goes for longer. So I'm sort of getting better at making things at a slower pace for longer uh, installations. Remember, I saw this great work over in Hamburg at the Hamburger Bahnhof that was, oh, I can't remember the artist's name right now, but it was a, it's called uh, Dripstein. And it was a drip that went right through from the roof of the building into the basement. And then the drip would come out onto a steel plate and it's making a um, stalagmite mm -hmm. that is over 500 years is going to be five centimetres tall. <laughs> so it's a really great, long, slow project. I was like, oh, I love that idea. You know? and I've, got a, I've got, a few, yeah. got a longer term <laughs> projects going at the moment. Yeah. Um, it was great commitment to culture, though, isn't it? 500 yeah, year project. Yeah, that's great. Come on, yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ecker, that's good. Uh, Hugo Ecker, I think his name is, with a U, U E C K E R. Mm. But it's a great project, yeah. I'll send you a link to that if I can, when I find it. Yeah. Ripstein. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So I really like those long-term projects. Now I've actually got one at Lilydale uh, Yarra Rangers Museum, just outside Melbourne, that's drawing permanently. And it, I've kind of worked out this gearing, so it's a wind-powered one that then comes into the museum through some axles in the window, 
and it's drawing on the wall, on the concrete wall, but very slowly. So it's got this lovely pace, but then it's accumulating marks on the wall in graphite. <clears throat> so it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a long-term one. And also the one I've got at Mona, a big um, wind drawing instrument called Wind Section Instrumental, that's you know, designed for a 50 year wind drawing episode. Um, so we're about four years into that, I think three or four years into that. So yeah, yeah pretty exciting to have those long-term ones up. Yeah, for sure. Um, mm. It's been great to chat to you today. I just wanted to ask one final question. I guess that was about, um, especially over this sort of the lockdown periods, have you, um, have you been, um, I guess, creating any other work um, just in terms of other sort of drawings or other paintings or other um, creative outputs. Um, I know uh, it's pretty hard to make music in the current sort of climate with other people, but um, yeah, have you been making any other work in the last sort of... Yeah, well, it's, been, it's been interesting because yeah, well, it's interesting about the music because, you know, I've, I've played, um, well, I've been playing clarinets for about 40 years and I've had a I had a gig every Sunday night for the last 11 years in St Kilda and um, with a great jazz band and we played jazz and blues and, you know, rocking the joint. It was just lovely playing clarinet and anyway, that's finished now. And so, you know, there's actually just no gigs. And so the inspiration to practice I find is very difficult. Like I'm actually enjoying um, focusing some time on some other things. And so one thing I've been doing is getting my grandfather's, you know, on plein air watercolor set and um, going out and doing some landscape paintings and sitting down, finding a nice, nice tussock to sit on, have a little flask with me. And um, it's been great to draw out there. And so I'm doing, yeah, doing a few things like that. I'm a bit shy about them though. I mean, I'm not about to start exhibiting as a painter. <laughs> I've got a, even more respect for the painters now. Oh yeah, I mean, really enjoying the um, permanent collection at Castlemaine Art Museum. Seeing the Streetons and the Be Claris Beckett's, and you know, they're just so beautiful. And you know, there's something about painting and going into that space where you're creating something without sort of talking to anyone else, which might sound ordinary for painters, but you know, as an installation artist, there's so many kind of emails and ringing people up about different components and working all these different things out. Um, the, you know, the painting world is just lovely. And in lockdown, it's been great to get in there. And, you know, regardless of what they're like, I've really been enjoying that process. You know, drawing and painting is the way artists, all artists communicate, really, or a lot of artists, um, especially if you're about to do an installation, you've got to actually go, okay, this is what I'm thinking, draw it out. And I've, I've always liked doing little um, pencil, pen and ink, sort of pencil and ink drawings for people. So you can see the shapes of things and the forms and all that. And so it's a bit of an extension of that. Good time to hone some of those things. And I'm also trying to, you know, work with colour a bit more. I've been looking at rainbows, for instance, and, you know, pretty common thing. But now I've been noticing the violet is incredibly hard to paint. So now I'm into violets. I'm going to the paint shop and seeing, like, 50 different violets and, you know, how do they do it? So yeah, it's a big world. Yeah. Yeah. I'll... Um... It's great to hear from you. Great to speak to you. And I'm, um, yeah, I hope everything goes well with you over the, the coming months. And yeah, looking forward to seeing some of those future projects, especially the uh, MCA projects, um, hopefully next year. Hopefully we can go and see things. Yeah, no, that would be great. Wouldn't it be great to be able to access art and uh, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy that again? But um, yeah, we'll thanks so much it. for um, uh, speaking with me uh, today. Great. Thanks for the opportunity, Danny. Great to see you and talk again.